So hello everybody. So welcome to this uh, event on uh, Enforces Appearances. I am very pleased and honored to present to you Professor Olivier de Fouville. Um, and my position as, as the chair for this event is especially meaningful for me as Olivier was the chair of my final PhD board six years ago. So it's funny to be on the other side uh, today. Um, Olivier is a professor public law uh, at the University of Paris II. Um, he is the director of the Paris, Paris Human Rights Center. And he's also a member of the Institut Universitaire de France uh, with a program on uh, a democratic theory of international law. In England, he's also a life member of the Clow Hall College uh, at the University of Cambridge. And so in part of his academic career, uh, Olivier de Fourville has worked for um, more than 20 years as a human rights expert uh, in the United Nations system. And in June 2019, he was elected as a member of the UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances. And this is a topic that uh, he's familiar with because he worked uh, at one point for the International Federation of Human Rights as a special envoy uh, on the, uh, the drafting of the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons Against and for Disappearances. Mm -hmm. And previously to be a human rights expert within the uh, UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances, he also was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee uh, between 2015 to 2018, and a member also of the work Working Group on Enforced uh, Disappearances. And he was the chairperson and rapporteur uh, of this group. So he has a tremendous experience on enforced disappearances, and so uh, this is why we uh, have the pleasure and the honor to have him today to uh, present a question, an important question on enforced disappearances uh, nowadays. Why are this topic uh, is, why this topic is quite disappearing from the international agenda? And so I'm leaving the floor to you. Thank you very much, Xavier. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure indeed to be, um, I, I wouldn't say here, but <laughs> there or somewhere, uh, but at least with, with you uh, online uh, discussing this topic. Uh, I would have uh, loved to come to Essex, to Colchester. Uh, last time I was there, was um, I was visiting uh, Nigel Rodley. So um, it was a, a fantastic memory um, of him inviting me in his, in his lecture to talk about the working group on enforced disappearance at that time. So it was a kind of a returning to um, uh, and coming back to that, uh, to, that, to that event and to that good memory um, that I had with him. Um, so the, the, title of the, uh, the title of the conference might seem a bit um, provocative. Are enforced disappearances disappearing from the multilateral agenda? And it may um, seem a bit pessimistic too. Uh, however, I, I want to support this idea that uh, we are now facing a kind of paradox. Never has this notion of enforced disappearances been so well identified at the international level, and yet it seems to be very low or even non existent on the multilateral agenda today. Um, I'm sure that almost everyone who is attending this conference, and I, I could see some, some of the names, uh, know not only a bit about enforced disappearances, but uh, a lot about enforced disappearances. Um, but I will, uh, for the others who know uh, less, um, and this is, this is completely fine, I, I will uh, try to recall briefly what we're talking about, the phenomenon, also uh, maybe why and that would be the first part of my of my talk. Why enforced disappearances came to be quite high on the on the multilateral agenda in the middle of the two thousands. Um, let me start by reading a text 
which is in fact taken from one of the urgent actions of the UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances. So one of these calls that the, the committee to which I am, uh, of which I'm a member, is sending to governments uh, to ask governments to take measures to locate a persons uh, when the committee receives allegation that this person has been abducted uh, and might be at risk of being disappeared. So I'm quoting this, uh, this urgent appeal. And of course, I've deleted the names and all references to a, a particular situation so that you cannot identify exactly to which case I'm, I'm referring to. But I thought it was interesting to take a real case so that you can see exactly how it goes and how it happens in the reality today. I'm quoting, according to the information provided, so provided to the committee by the source, on day X, Mr. Y posted on his personal Facebook the following post. The, blo the blood of the martyrs is more honorable than all the murderous politicians. So that's an opinion. Might not be a good opinion, but it's an opinion. He was referring to the massacre that had happened a few days before, allegedly conducted by security forces of the state. In response to that post, he received threats, including from one from the cousin of the current head of the Parliament Council, Mr. Z. On the same day, at 8 p.m., four men came to his home by car, holding weapons and wearing civilian clothes. They identified themselves as members of the National Intelligence Service. They did not have any arrest warrant. They explained that they did not intend to arrest Mr. Y, but only wanted to interrogate him. They forcibly put him in the car and took him to an unknown place. According to the information provided, Mr. Y family went to the police station and the National Intelligence Service branch to inquire about his whereabouts but to no avail. When they returned to the police station to submit an official complaint, they were advised not to submit the complaint as it would affect negatively Mr. Y. And that's a quotation within the quotation. That's what the uh, uh, security services are conveying as a message to the family. This might, if, you, if you're trying to get some information, this might affect negatively Mr. Y. Afterwards, the family informally contacted one of the high-ranking officers in the intelligence and anti-terrorism unit. He told them, and this is again a quote within the quote, not to worry, as he knew the place where Mr. Y was detained. He, however, did not disclose further information in that regard. To date, the authorities have not provided any information as to Mr. Y's fate and whereabouts. So as I said, this is a real case, but for those who, who know and uh, who know more about the phenomenon of enforced disappearances, you could say this is a kind of archetypal case of enforced disappearance. I guess everyone can, uh, uh, can put uh, uh, him or herself at the place of the family desperately trying to get some reliable information on, on what happened to Mr. Y. Enforced disappearance, as you can imagine, is, a, is torture, not only for the person who is being abducted and taken to an unknown uh, secret detention center, generally for being tortured, but also for the family, uh, which are uh, sometimes for years or decades suffering from uncertainty, anguish, uh, and the impossibility to mourn, or to even know whether they have to mourn the person who has been disappeared. Not speaking of the social stigma, which in general uh, is, uh, uh, is a consequence of the disappearance uh, for the family, and also the legal obstacles faced by those who are left behind, and in particular, and in general, for the most women. Disappearing persons as a form of political repression, as an instrument of states against people is not new. This practice of terror was even legally codified in uh, the sadly famous Hitler's Night and Folk Decree. 
The program was considered as a crime of war by the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal, and also subsequently as a crime against humanity by the US Tribunal in Nuremberg in the so-called justice case the judgment of 4 December 1947. And I, I quote this judgment because I think it's a good, again, description of what enforced disappearance is, even though at that time it was not called enforced disappearance. It was really targeting the night and folk decree and the practices under that decree. And I quote the judgment, during the war, in addition to deporting millions of inhabitants of occupied territories for slave labor and other purposes, Hitler's Night and Folk program was instituted for the deportation to Germany of many thousands of inhabitants of occupied territories for the purpose of making them disappear without trace and so that their subsequent fate remain secret. This practice created an atmosphere of constant fear and anxiety among their relatives, friends, and the population of the occupied territories. So as you can see that the target of the practice is, is, um, is both the person who is uh, being thrown into this legal vacuum, into this black hole of secret detention, but also the people who are left behind, the families who are, uh, and, and the, the, the idea behind the practice being to terrorize the civil civilian population, those who are left behind, the families, to keep them in a state of anguish and fear. Unfortunately, the practice did not end with the end of the Second World War. On the contrary, it spread all over the world. Counterinsurgency tactics developed against liberation armies in the a process of decolonization, like in Indochina and Algeria, but also uh, later on uh, against left wing political movements, especially in Latin America. Uh, uh, in the 70s and the beginning of the 90s uh, continued this practice and in fact uh, got to a certain degree of sophistication. The specificity of that form of repression together with uh, on the side of torture and uh, summary executions, the specificity of enforced disappearance became visible um, at this particular time in the 17s in Latin America, because victims, um, the families of those who had disappeared, started to mobilize and started to talk and started to demonstrate. In the beginning, uh, in the uh, 1975, uh, after, in particular, the Chilean uh, coup d'etat, uh, the United Nations and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights started to speak and to raise concerns about missing persons, uh, which means uh, persons who had gone missing for whatever reason, you know, but that there could be several reasons, there can be several reasons why people go, go missing. But the victims of this particular practice of enforced disappearances, and especially the mothers of the disappeared, started to speak of something different, which was not missing persons for the, whatever reason, but persons who had been forcibly disappeared. So it been taken by the security officers, by the police, uh, by the intelligence services, people who had been taken uh, very often without a warrant, thrown into the, the booth of the car, um, sent to and brought to an unknown location, and then no news, no information came out. And, and the only response by the power that by, by that time was that that person had escaped. There was no information about that person. There was nothing that could, uh, there was no information that could be provided. So they started to speak about those people being forcibly disappeared by, by the state. And, and, and this is how uh, this is how it started, you know, with the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, for instance, with their white scarf that you probably all have seen, and the picture of their loved one walking around the square of Plaza de Mayo, accusing the states 
and the militaries of being responsible of their of the disappearances of the loved ones. And in response to that, the militaries said that they were crazy, the crazy women of the mother, the Plaza de Mayo. Of course, they were not crazy. And in fact, the allegations and their claims were well, well below the reality as it is now uncovered by the trials taking place in Argentina. From that time, the issue of enforced disappearance emerged slowly on the multilateral agenda at the regional and international level. And again, I apologize for those who very well know all these uh, and all this story, but I'm, I'm also talking for those who are not so familiar to the story uh, and the development of uh, the category, the legal category of enforced disappearances in international law. At the United Nations level in particular, the attention, as I said, was first raised on the situation of Chile. And they were first resolution, as I said, that were targeting missing persons, but that slowly, that's, that language with the pressure of the families that started to organize moved towards the idea of disappeared persons and then enforced disappearances. And that uh, up to 1979 and in fact 1980, where uh, the Commission on Human Rights adopted its first resolution on uh, enforced or involuntary disappearances. And so in that resolution, very important resolution of 1980, not only the, um, not only the Commission of Human Rights identified as such the practice of enforced disappearances, that is persons being abducted by security services by the state apparatus and then the fact of, uh, of refusing or denying even the detention, refusing to provide information or even denying the information, that's completely, in fact, uh, uh, removing the person from the protection of the law, uh, putting that person in, into a state of legal uh, vacuum. Not only the commission identified this phenomenon of repression, but also it also decided to create a new monitoring mechanism um, a five uh, independent experts working group, uh, which is still uh, functioning today, which is still in existence today, and that is called the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. Um, this working group, five independent uh, members, um, five experts, um, was created at that time with a very broad mandate basically to look at the issue of enforced disappearances throughout the world, but it rapidly developed a number of efficient methods of works, and in particular, uh, the ancestor of the urgent actions that now the Committee on Enforced Disappearances is implementing, and I was speaking about um, uh, just, uh, just before, that is uh, the fact of sending urgent appeals uh, to states in case of uh, information allegations of a person being abducted. So the, the idea being to, uh, to react as fast as possible to try to prevent that person from uh, disappearing completely. And in fact, from being killed, uh, from, being, from dying under torture and trying to extract that person from the state of secret detention, from, from that legal vacuum in which they were from. Um, I can come back, of course, in the discussion for those who are interested on the, on the methods of work of the, of the working group. Um, but um, what is interesting, I think, is that in this process, the working group started to um, and helped very much to uh, throughout the years to identify uh, further the, the, the practice, the rights involved, uh, the notion itself and the legal elements of enforced disappearances. In the same period, uh, there were other international bodies that, that got some cases of enforced disappearances. And first the UN Human Rights Committee, which is in charge of, uh, which you may know is in charge of the of monitoring the uh, implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
um, there is a, an optional protocol to the to the covenant under which the committee uh, is, uh, has the competence to receive individual communications alleging violations of the covenant. And, and uh, Uruguay uh, was uh, one of the states who somehow made the mistake to ratify the protocol uh, before the practice started. Uh, and so some cases uh, came uh, through and were sent to the committee, some cases of enforced disappearances. And so the committee started to uh, decide on cases of enforced disappearances and to figure out what this practice, what rights this practice, what rights incorporated in the covenant were violated by this practice. A bit later on, the, uh, the uh, of course, the Inter-American Commission also got very involved from the start into the issue. Um, the European Commission uh, at that time also got involved uh, into the issue, although in a, in a very superficial manner, uh, but on the occasion of the case that were that was brought against, uh, uh, against Turkey uh, concerning the Cyprus uh, conflict. And uh, later on in 1988, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, rendered a, a landmark case that you've probably heard about, which is the Velasquez Rodriguez versus Honduras case, which was uh, again one of the first clear identification of the phenomenon of enforced disappearances um, with everything that was involved in that in terms of uh, in terms of practice in terms of secrecy in terms of uh, using non-official forces to do the to do the, 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 the job in terms of uh, in terms of hiding the truth um, in terms of a, of a continuous practice, also of uh, a continuous violation. Uh, and that aspect was also seen in terms of the difficulty to um, have access to effective remedies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights came, came much later uh, in the beginning of the 90s uh, with a number of cases concerning Turkey. And in, in fact, the, this enforced this practice of enforced disappearances in Kurdistan. Um, in parallel to these important steps in terms of litigation, which were, I think, central, I mean, in, in, in the development of the notion, some progress were also made in pushing for the adoption of, the new, of new legal instruments. And that's another part of the, I would say, the multilateral agenda and visibility, of, uh, probably the, the central part of the, of the visibility of enforced disappearances during this period, um, especially not only in regional organizations, but also especially in the, in the, in the United Nations. Um, in January 1981, uh, the, the process, so it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite old in fact, and it started quite early. In 1981, the, the process of, uh, uh, of, having, uh, of drafting a convention started. Uh, a conference was, uh, was held in Paris at the invitation of a number of NGOs uh, and, and, and uh, personalities. The refusal of oblivion, the refus d'oubli, and the participants set an agenda and as a project, the, the drafting of the international convention. So they wanted to, to launch this campaign of an international convention. And this was somehow also used as a, as a banner uh, by the first uh, international transnational movement of victims of families of disappeared that started in 1979, which is the FEDEFAM, which is the Federation of the Families of the Disappeared in Latin America. And they really used the, the project of the convention as a mobilizing uh, force and topic to uh, advocate uh, the issue of enforced disappearances and against uh, impunity of perpetrators of enforced disappearances. So that's how progressively the issue appeared also uh, before intergovernmental bodies. Uh, the, uh, the, the General Assembly of the OAS, for instance, in 1983, adopted its first resolution on the issue of enforced disappearance. Um, and it started a, a whole process, which in fact uh, led to the adoption of a, a convention, uh, Inter-American Convention 
against enforced disappearances in the framework of the Organization of American States. So well before the adoption of the convention uh, in, in the United Nations. At the United Nations, the idea was to go through a, a more cautious approach. Uh, there was this idea that it would, be in, it, would, it would not be probably cautious to go directly for a convention. So the, uh, the, the approach that was chosen was a two-step approach uh, with first the adoption of a declaration and then second, only secondly as a second step, a convention. The uh, declaration was adopted on the 18th December 1992. Uh, the, it was a first victory which had been pushed and prepared by Fede Femme, by Amnesty International, the International Commission of Jurists, Louis Joannet also was the, the French expert, uh, the then French expert at the Subcommission of Human Rights, played a major role in um, bringing the project uh, before the Subcommission and then sending it to the, to the Commission and then to the General Assembly. So it was the first victory, which was then followed by a new process, which started effectively in, in 1996 to draft the convention and, and slowly um, uh, try to move things forward uh, at the intergovernmental level. So to make a long story uh, short, the negotiations after a number of uh, uh, steps started in 2003 before a working group, uh, uh, which was presided by, by France, a French diplomat, and it led two years after, uh, and three years after, in fact, uh, before the General Assembly, by the, to the adoption of the text by the General Assembly, so on 20 December uh, 20, um, uh, 2006. And the text was formally opened for signature in Paris on 2 February 2007, and only 57 states uh, then signed the text. So the, these various processes of standard setting played a very important role um, and somehow created a dynamic around the issue of enforced disappearances at the international level. And it, it in fact, uh, created the momentum uh, and it created the, uh, the attention uh, of the multilateral organizations on this particular issue. The key, was, the key to this dynamic was, of course, the mobilization of civil society organizations, and especially the relatives of the disappeared persons. And I have spoken already of the Fede Fam. But then after Fede Fam in the 90s and then the beginning of the 20 to 20 to 2000s, other organizations and especially transnational networks of organizations of families were created. Uh, in 1997, uh, the, uh, the Asian Federation uh, of Enforced Disappearances was uh, initiated, which gathered a number of Asian organizations uh, concerned with the issue of enforced disappearances or associations of families of the disappeared. And uh, in 2000, the FIDH, the Inter International Federation of Human Rights Leagues, and the Collective des Familles de Disparus en Algérie, the CFDA, Algerian uh, Families uh, Collective, uh, as well as a, a movement of uh, Lebanese uh, in favor of the Lebanese people who had been uh, victims of enforced uh, disappearances in Lebanon, um, in, held or in, initiated the first conference at the Euro-Mediterranean level. And they started a process that came uh, to, uh, that, uh, that, that finally resulted in the creation of the FEMED, that is the Euro-Mediterranean Federation Against Enforced Disappearances in 2005. During these years, there was also, um, uh, but it, 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 it unfortunately it did not last very long. But there was the, uh, in a nutshell, there was a the, the the beginning of a network, an African network, against enforced disappearances, and a number of organizations joined the network, but it finally did not uh, did not uh, succeed. So, uh, for the farm, Afad. Uh, members of FEMED, members of African organizations, uh, other organizations, international NGOs attended the whole process of negotiation of the convention from 2003 to 2005. And this was greatly facilitated at that time, I must say, 
by a Dutch organization, the Humanist Committee on Human Rights, uh, through a program, specific program that had uh, that was funded for that purpose, which was called Linking Solidarity. The, the program basically aimed at identifying associations of families and putting them into contact. Linking Solidarity also provided the means uh, for the organizations and the people, members of the organizations to meet, um, to coordinate their positions, uh, to reflect upon the text of the draft convention, and also to be present and to attend the sessions of uh, the, the working group that drafted the convention in Geneva, that the, the sessions were held in Geneva. So they had to be taken from the Philippines, from uh, Latin America, from Africa, in Geneva, and stay there for two weeks to attend the session. Um, so uh, this organization played a, a key role in the sense that it allowed those families to actively participate in the process and to, and they, and, and they, in fact, during the process played a key role in the sense that they fully intervened, they, they, they spoke, uh, and they had the chance to, um, to give an idea, a very concrete idea to the state's party, to the diplomats who were participating to the, to the negotiation of what enforced disappearance was in reality. After the adoption of the convention, linking solidarity continued its work by facilitating the creation of the ICAID, namely the International Coalition Against Enforced Disappearances. And the ICAED was established uh, mainly to promote the quick ratification of the convention. So the goal was really promoting the ratification of the convention. And it actively operated from 2007 till let's say 2013, where uh, when it had to reduce its activities due to lack of uh, proper funding. So the activism by civil society actors uh, was, was crucial, but of course it was supported by key states too. And this is always a combination of states and, and civil society that, uh, that, that in fact allows a, a, such a project to come to fruition. So during the negotiations of the convention, Latin American countries were very committed for the quick adoption of the convention, especially Argentina, of course, played a major role. And France um, had been committed to the issue from the beginning of the 1980s, as I said. It was a, the state that, uh, that tabled the first resolution on enforced disappearances. France also presided the exercise of the drafting of the declaration, and then it continued by playing a crucial role and, and chairing the exercise of drafting of the convention. After the conclusion of the negotiation and the adoption of the convention, the ID um, of the those states basically, which had actively participated in support of the convention was to create a group of friends of the convention so as to help and to promote the ratification of the convention. It was initially composed uh, of France and Argentina uh, and uh, which, which became the two co-sponsors of the resolution tabled every three years at the uh, Human Rights uh, Council and the group was progressively enlarged to uh, other states like Morocco, Japan, or, or South Korea. In 2007, enforced disappearance did not seem to be a problem of the past at all. Uh, on the contrary, and at that time, there was a renewed concern of the new types of enforced disappearances, uh, sometimes short-term enforced disappearances, as they were called, but not Sometimes they were also long-term, continuous, uh, cl more classical, let's say, enforced disappearances of long-term people not, not reappearing, even after a certain period of time, but all in the context, in a particular context of the fight against terrorism. And in particular, the program of extraordinary renditions appeared to be a uh, especially sophisticated form of enforced disappearance, which reminded of the dark times of the Plan Condor, uh, which had been uh, implemented by the dictators of the Southern Cone in Latin America. Um, in 2010, the convention introduced the force with the deposit of the 20th instrument of, uh, of the ratification by Iraq. 
And by that time, 2010, it, it may be possible to say that the place of enforced disappearances on the multilateral agenda was at its highest somehow. But then unfortunately, I guess it, it started to decrease slowly. Now, things uh, I think have gotten to the point that I'm wondering, uh, as I said, whether enforced disappearances are not progressively disappearing from the multilateral agenda. And I would like to list a few points which I think that are, are, clean, are clear signs of that trend. That will be the second part of my, of my talk and I would try to, uh, to, go, uh, to go a bit faster. Uh, this is of course, notwithstanding all the things that have been done by all actors uh, in the recent years, including very recently in the context of the 10th anniversary of the entry into force of the convention, many things and fantastic things have been done and this is not to deny this. So I'm not saying that enforced disappearances have disappeared. I'm saying that there's a trend which raises concerns and I think should trigger a reaction now to prevent that from happening. First, the pace for the ratification of the convention is clearly not up to the expectation. Just compare with another convention which was adopted just at the same time as the Convention on Enforced Disappearances, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. Today has reached 182 states parties and only 63 for the Convention on Enforced Disappearances. So you may of course object that there are understandable reasons to this. And you may say, for instance, that uh, the subjects are different. Uh, all states may prima facie feel concerned with the issue of disabilities, but it might not be the case uh, for enforced disappearance. I take the point, but I would respond that this is a kind of prejudice. When discussing the drafting of the convention already, uh, some states were reluctant to deal with, it, with this issue. In fact, some states resisted the idea of having the convention being discussed at the United Nations because, and the main argument was the same prejudice basically that enforced disappearance was a regional problem, was a Latin American problem. Only happened in Latin America at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. So, why, why are we bringing this issue at the universal level as it only concerns a specific region? Of course, a quick look at the report of the working group on uh, enforced or involuntary disappearances and enough to see that since its creation, the working group has transmitted uh, 58,666 uh, cases to 109 countries on all continents of the world. But this idea that this is a Latin American problem is still unfortunately deeply rooted in people's minds. Another idea is that states that have not experienced enforced disappearances in their history should not feel concerned. Of course, this is completely wrong again. The convention has a preventive dimension. A number of provisions are uh, in fact uh, about the prevention and what to do and what legislation to adopt and what practices to adopt in order to prevent future enforced disappearances that may happen in certain situations. Um, and as for the present by ratifying the convention, the goal is that states would participate in a global effort to uh, fight and to eliminate enforced disappearances, to cooperate so as to provide assistance to victims and to fight against impunity, including by implementing extraterritorial jurisdiction and through judicial cooperation. So in the end, there is no valuable reason for states not to ratify this treaty. This is all about a lack of education and information. States are not sufficiently aware of these issues. So to strengthen awareness, we would obviously need a strong campaign in favor of ratification. But this is the second sign of, of that worrying trend I'm speaking about. After the first years, from let's say 2007 to 2013, the campaign of ratification seemed to have run out of steam. 
the group of friends of the convention have limited themselves to organizing a few conferences and side events, which is fantastic, but which is obviously not enough to promote the ratification uh, through, for instance, a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, dialogue uh, with states that may be reluctant to ratify the convention through training programs, for instance, that may participate in this awareness raising about the problem of enforced disappearances and what, can, and what states can do against it. In 2017, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the, of the signature of the convention, former UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, Said Al Hussein, called in a message, and I quote, to set today the bold goal of doubling ratifications of the convention in the next five years, adding that all together we have the power to achieve this. This was in 2017, but it seems that the all together meant in fact that no one in particular was in charge. No action was taken to fulfill this promise, which then appeared retrospectively as a simple vow. There were 55 states parties in 2017, and there are now eight more, that is 63. And it is now clear that the target of 110 is out of reach for 2022. The ICAED, which was the pillar of the campaign, is not funded for its activities, and it is left to its individual members to undertake actions on its behalf, and in particular, members of the, FEDIF, of the, of the AFAD. If you visit the website of the coalition, you will see that all substantive activities, apart from a number of statesmen, have ceased since 2013, at least. The 10th anniversary of the entry into force of the convention was the occasion for a number of events and conferences organized by the WAGD, by the CED, but also by FEMED, the CFDR. A lot of videos, interviews, declarations were also produced by the Office of the High Commissioner, which I think was unprecedented and must really be praised. But as valuable as those efforts are, they do not constitute a campaign that would trigger the bold move towards universal ratification that we need. A third sign that enforced disappearances are not closely scrutinized anymore is that most of the current hotspots of enforced disappearances in the world today are not the object of a close monitoring by international institutions, if we accept, of course, the CG and the Working Group on Enforced Disappearances. There are certainly some situations that are uh, spotted, that are uh, monitored, uh, and I uh, think, for instance, of Syria, of North Korea, and to a certain extent, Libya or Yemen. But take Iraq. Mexico, um, uh, take, uh, for instance, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, Cameroon, Nigeria, Egypt. They do not raise the attention of intergovernmental bodies. They're not mentioned and not followed up closely through monitoring mechanisms by, for instance, the Human Rights Council. The same can be said of a number of transition processes, which were to some extent closely monitored in the past, but which seem now to have disappeared from the agenda. And I'm thinking in particular about Nepal, for instance, which recently reported to the Human Rights Council in the context of the Universal Periodic Review. But it's, it's I mean, the conclusion is that the, co the process of transitional justice is stalled there and that the Human Rights Office has closed in 2011. There are other countries which were more closely looked, I would say, at some point, like Algeria, for instance. It just seems now that the families are left alone. The fourth sign is the lack of sufficient support for uh, the UN mechanisms. In a way, it can be said that there has not been much change on this front as far as, far as the Working Group on Enforced Disappearances is concerned. At least when I was a member, we already had the same issue. Although the, the working group is, is following up on thousands of individual cases, it is provided by the High Commissioner's Office with the regular one and a half staff members to, ser to serve as a secretariat. The needed additional resources for the working group uh, to fulfill its mandate effectively are provided through extra budgetary funds by mainly France and more recently Japan or the Republic of Korea. 
The committee on its side has recently elaborated a document to try to anticipate on its needs in the years to come. The committee sits for four weeks in total during a year, except in COVID time. Um, and um, it was that it was calculated by the Secretariat that uh, on the basis of the number of states parties, uh, the current number of states parties, this is, this is clearly insufficient. And recently the, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances also issued a press release, you may have seen, drawing attention that it had registered its 1,000 urgent requests to locate victims. And the Secretariat calculated that in view of the work required at the different steps of this complex procedure of urgent appeals, which means following up each case one by one, the committee would need additional resources, namely additional uh, three additional staff at the P3 level. No response by states has been given so far. Victims are waiting. And the OHH star, the OHHR staff, I can testify, is doing their best, and more than their best, in fact, not, not to keep the victims waiting more than the 48 hours, which is set as a rule to process the request. But for how long? Can it go? There are many other sides I could spell out, like for instance, the lack of any multilateral initiative since the adoption of the convention, the lack of any support by states to a number of initiatives proposed by the CG or by the working group, the lack of real support that can also be seen in the brevity of the resolutions which are adopted every three years by the Human Rights Council, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that could be opposed to the idea that enforced disappearances are disappearing from the multilateral agenda is the growing attention given to the issue of missing persons. And this is true, the issue of missing persons first appeared on the agenda of the late Commission on Human Rights in the beginning of the 2000s. And it clearly made a new breakthrough in the recent years. The General Assembly has adopted a number of resolutions on the issue. Uh, the Security Council itself, after a special debate requested by Kuwait and other states adopted resolution 2474 in June 2019, calling upon, for instance, all parties to armed conflict to take all appropriate measures to actively search for persons reported missing, etc. This issue is actively promoted by the International Committee of the Red Cross, the RCRC, at the United Nations. So isn't this activity in relation to missing persons benefiting to the promotion of the rights of victims of enforced disappearances? The answer here can only be nuanced. The category of missing persons does not fit exactly with the category of enforced disappearances. It is broader in the sense that persons can go missing for various reasons, for instance, being missing on the battlefield. But it is also uh, narrower um, in the sense that enforced disappearances uh, under the Geneva Convention and Protocol 1 concerns people who go missing in the context of a armed conflict, whereas enforced disappearances can occur also in times of peace. But most importantly, the approach privileged by the RCRC and by humanitarian law is a humanitarian approach centered on the needs of victims rather than on the rights of victims. Justice is not formally excluded, but it's clearly seen as a secondary goal in a sequence process. Conversely, the law applicable to enforce disappearance does not create such priorities for the simple reason that enforced disappearances are crimes and that the victims have an equal right to the truth, justice, and reparation. In this regard, the missing approach may even be they even prove in certain contexts detrimental to the cause of the fight against enforced disappearances in the sense that it offers an alternative routes, an alternative framework for states that are willing for political reasons to deal with this issue of enforced disappearances through a humanitarian approach only versus a legalistic or a judicial approach. So in conclusion, what can we do to counter the negative trend that I have tried to identify? How can we revive the spirit and the positive energy that led to the adoption of the convention? First and foremost, 
we, and in particular the states, must now be serious when speaking about a campaign for universal ratification. A few conferences and side events won't achieve the results we are aiming at. A model that could serve as an inspiration is the campaign which is currently uh, underway for the ratification of the Convention Against Torture, the campaign called CTI, which uh, emanates from a group of states. Second, there must be a renewed and a strong initiative and support towards associations of the families of the disappeared. As we've seen, they are the key actors to promote the convention and raise awareness around the issue of enforced disappearances. More broadly, families and relatives must be supported. Meeting and talking to them across countries is not a luxury. It is part of the healing process. It is also the key to a more efficient action against a crime that has the same hideous face on all continents. We would need a new linking solidarity today to support the families worldwide. More support is also needed to each associations at the domestic level so that they are in a position to continue claiming for truth and justice and repression in front of their local governments, which very often try, are trying to silence them. Third, the states that have experienced enforced disappearances or that are currently experiences, experiencing enforced disappearances should be encouraged to hold a peer dialogue at the intergovernmental level so as to exchange on good practices, especially on the issues of strategies that should be implemented for the search of the disappeared persons and the connection with the necessary judicial investigation to fight against impunity. And fourth, and finally, the bodies in charge of the issue of enforced disappearances should be strengthened and their coordination and complementarity should be facilitated. The CD and the working group are working well together, but for lack of means and time, the coordination with regional mechanisms is, is insufficient. Recently, the working group and the committee started to work more closely with the African Commission on Human Rights and People's Rights. But the working relations with regional courts or the Inter-American Commission are too rare so as to create a fruitful synergy. My call would then go to the states and civil society organizations to, join, to jointly hold a world forum against enforced disappearances a world forum which would gather all stakeholders and interested parties. The forum could elaborate a common plan of action to achieve the goal of universal ratification and secure the necessary funds to support the activities planned in favor of that campaign. It could also be an opportunity to launch a new initiative in favor of victims of enforced disappearance so as to support their work at the domestic level and their contacts across borders. And finally, it could also be the starting point of a new process of a peer dialogue between interested states so as to better exchange on their respective experiences, their respective perspectives and good practices in the fight against enforced disappearances. These are some of the proposals that could be promoted so as to make that Enforced disappearances does not disappear from the multilateral agenda in the next 10 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I've been longer than I expected, but uh, this was the message that I wanted to convey. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor de Fourville. And I'm sure all the people we have uh, seen to think about enforced disappearances and uh, we wish you a good end of the week to all and maybe see you to the next event uh, from the Essex Human Rights Center. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation.